Well, good morning on this wet morning. Everybody got a little sprinkle coming in, I see. We are going to be in Galatians chapter 5 today. Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me. Suffering from acid reflux. Lots of fun. A little too much information this early? Sorry. All right. Um, <clears throat> moving along through the book of Galatians, we've come to chapter 5 to a portion of Scripture. Um, I've entitled the message, How Do You Know You're His? How do you know that you're a child of God? So let's start out by the reading of the Word. Let's look at verses today, uh, 13 through 21. Galatians 5, verse 13. For brethren... You have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, or sin, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Thus I say, then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So apparently there's a bunch more. Of these which I have told you before, I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Aren't you glad you came today? Anybody read ahead? Obviously you didn't read ahead. Because this is an uncomfortable portion of Scripture, and it usually turns a lot of people away. So I'm glad you're here. Ushers, lock the doors. Uh, We're not going to let them out. We're going to go through this stuff. Because, listen, God wants us to go through this stuff. Amen? Amen. And we can't just skip over stuff. And, uh, you know, my boss tells me I have to teach this. So we're going to go through it, and and it's going to be a little uncomfortable. So let's pray right now. And ask the Lord to open our hearts and to receive what he has for us. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. It not only encourages us. It not only shows us your great love for us. It not only reveals your grace to us. But it also corrects us. And, Lord, we want to be all that we can be for you. And so we pray right now that you would give us the heart to receive correction because there's something in here for all of us. And so, Lord, would you just uh, do what you do best? Do surgery. You're the great physician. Do surgery in our hearts, Lord, and make us more like you. Draw us close to you and give us ears to hear today what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Not an easy portion of Scripture uh, to deal with. Um, As I read that list, when he said such like, that means that there's a bunch of other stuff too. That means that you can read like Colossians and Ephesians, and even in the book of Revelation, and find out some of the other sins that he would be talking about there. And Because we have a tendency to put sins on levels, don't we? Like, you know, I'm not a murderer, I just like to gossip. God puts it on the same level. And so as we come to this portion of Scripture, when I read those sins, and he said those that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God, you kind of gasp. Because I don't know about you, but some of that stuff in there was speaking to me. Was any of it speaking to you? Three people? All right. We're not going to get very far today. Um, (laughs) The question is this. How do you know your gods? How do you know you're a child of God? Let me tell you how. First off, your sin makes you sick. You hate your sin. Second, you love people. You have a love for people. You used to not have a love for everybody. Now you have a love for everybody. You're even loving your enemy. And, and the other thing is, is that there, there's a war going on inside. And we just read that. And, and this portion of Scripture is a portion that a lot of churches don't even want to deal with. 
sad to say. I've had the honor of teaching this. This is my third time teaching in this church the book of Galatians. And I'm, I keep learning so much as the years go on. But one thing I learned was that back in, you know, for the last 20 years of listening to other great teachers teach this, I think I get the feeling that they feel just like me. This is uncomfortable. Because when you talk about this stuff, here's what's going to happen. People are going to get mad at me. People are going to email me. If you want to email me, email austinrex at gmail.com. Okay? He'll handle that. Don't just don't email me. Don't shoot the messenger. This is the message. If you get mad, you're getting mad with God. Okay? Because I'm just going to read Bible today. Bible's going to work in our hearts. If this doesn't pertain to you, great. If it does, then deal with it. God wants the best for you. He wants us to flee from these things. And it's important for us to, to look at these things and, and really question ourselves, how do you know you're his? Let every man, let every woman examine their heart to see with, whether they're in the faith. Do you love people? Does your sin make you sick? It should. And if it doesn't, you've got to ask yourself, am I really a child of God? Or am I just looking for fire insurance? Right? In verse 1, he says, For brethren, we have been called unto liberty, called unto this grace, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. He's saying that you and I as believers are enjoying this grace of God. And he says, and he's saying this because of the legalists who are trying to fight with Paul and bring people back under the law, and Paul's not going to have any of it. He says the law can't save you. Nobody can keep the law. Why would we bring people under the bondage of, of things that even our fathers couldn't keep, nor us? And Jesus came to fulfill the law, so we're no longer under the law. We've been delivered from the law. Jesus was the end of the law. And if we're under that grace, if we're being led by the Spirit, we're not under the law. How many times does he have to say it? We're not under the law. Praise God. Because you and I can't keep the law. And the law will frustrate us. And so God says, listen, I fulfilled everything in the law at the cross. I put an end to the law. Now enjoy my grace. It's a greater power than the law. Because I'm trying to keep the law in my flesh. I couldn't. Now I'm being led by the Spirit of Christ that dwells in me. I, I do so much better being led by the Spirit. And so he says, listen, Paul's talking to these legalists because the legalists would say to you and me, oh, you guys are those gracers. You are those people are thinking, just go out and do whatever you want and say, Lord, forgive me. And you just, you know, you think grace is a license of sin. And Paul's saying, God forbid. He lists all those different sins. And he said, there's even more than what I listed there. And he's trying to say, listen, I don't endorse this. God doesn't endorse this. God doesn't give us a license of sin. How ridiculous does that sound? It's because we understand the grace of God and how much he loves us and how much he did for us that we don't want to do anything to hurt him. And so we walk better now than we did before we got saved. Amen? Oh, thank God for his grace. Thank God for the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the thing is with legalists is that they get so caught up in rules and regulations and do this and don't do that and I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do that. What happens? They get so caught up doing the do's and the don'ts that they don't do anything that God wants them to do. They're so caught up in trying to keep laws and rules and regulation and to make sure that you don't go out of those boundaries. They, they don't get out there and do anything that God's been telling them to do. And that's called the sins of omission. When, you know, it's great that you're not doing this and you're not doing that and you're following this and you're following that, but are you doing what God's telling you to do? And if you're not, you're missing the whole point. See, I don't know about you, but legalists that I come into contact with are always trying to straighten me out and trying to pull me away from the grace of God and getting me to jump through hoops saying that I got to do these things in order to be saved. And that's, that's a different gospel. I have to have faith, faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. And that's the only thing that saves me. It's not by my performance. My performance is a reflection of my love. James isn't saying you got to work to, to earn God's love. James says, I will show you my faith by my works. James was on the same page as Paul. He was saved by grace, not by his efforts, not by his works, but the evidence of his saving salvation was the fact that he served God. 
Serving God doesn't save you. It's evidence that you love him. And that's important for us to understand. And then that grace that we've been shown by God should be a grace that we show others by loving others and serving others. Jesus had tremendous liberty. Jesus was all mighty. All, he's the creator. He could have exercised his power at any time. He, he did at times exercise his power. He walked on water, right? He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He healed people. He fed the 5,000. But what did Jesus use his liberty for? To serve others. So the grace that God has given you and the liberty that God has given you is to serve one another. Look at verse 14. It says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Paul just narrowed it down. He just narrowed it down to one thing. And that's so important for us to grab onto because the legalists were pulling on the 613 laws of, of Moses. you got to keep those. And then there was others that just narrowed it down to the ten because we know if we're not keeping one commandment, we're guilty of breaking them all. Amen? And so then Jesus comes along and he narrows it down to two. Let me, we're sheep, right? We're sheep, right? Okay. You think that's cute, we're fluffy, we're clean, we're cuddly, we, you know, cuddly and everything. No, we're pretty stupid. Sheep are pretty dumb. A sheep can go behind a rock and get lost. A sheep can look a wolf right in the face and go, bah. A sheep, a whole pile of sheep can be walking one way and a sheep will walk off the cliff, the rest will follow. That's us. We're sheep. And God says, listen, let me make it simple for you. Forget the 613 Forget the ten. If you shall love the Lord God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two, you'll be keeping all of them. See, the key is love. And then Paul brings it all the way down to one. The key to success is love. Love God with all your heart, with everything you got. And love your neighbor. That means you go out and you make a point to find people to love on. You know, Buddha said this. He said, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Well, that's in the negative tense. If the whole world do th did that, we would all be sitting in neutral and nobody would ever get anything done. Jesus turns that around and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, do unto others as you would do, want them to do unto you. So where you've got one group that's saying don't do unto others as you wouldn't want done to you, they're not getting anything done. Jesus says, now you go out and love everybody. And you go out and treat everybody like you want to be treated. Isn't that good, st good stuff? See, the idea is when he says love others like you love yourself, it's kind of like it's understood we love ourselves, right? I know it's early, but, but work with me here. Because you hear people say stuff like this. I can't love others until I learn to love myself. The Bible says that's a lie. The Bible says you already know how to love yourself. Now love others like you want to be loved, right? And when you talk to somebody who says, I don't love myself. I hate myself. Why do you hate yourself? I don't like the way I look. Well, you obviously love yourself because if you hated yourself, you'd like the way you look. Does that make sense? The Bible implies that we already know how to love ourselves. And he says, go out there and love others like that. So what does that mean? That means now you are other centered. You are not self centered. That means you're thinking of others more than you're thinking of yourself. That means when it comes down to an opportunity to give to somebody else, do you keep the better thing or do you give the better thing to them? Or do you give them the worst thing and keep the better thing for yourself? Does that make sense? When you want to bless somebody, you want to give them something that means something to you. Over the years, we've had people donate stuff to the church. Pastor, I got this great couch. We want to donate it to the church. Oh, okay. And then you go to get the couch. You find out it's all beat up. It's stained. It's flea-ridden. And you're like, basically, you didn't want to take it to the dump, so you thought you'd be cool and donate it to us. That's not giving God your best. We had somebody that, that tried to give us a car. They wanted to donate a car. And then I said, what kind of car is it? They said a Mercedes. I'm like, wow, that'd be pretty cool for me to drive around a Mercedes, right? 
And, and it turned out the thing needed so much work, it was basically a, a piece of junk, and they just wanted us to tow it away. That's not giving God your best. That's not giving to others your best. You want to have this attitude like if you're at a barbecue and you're cooking steaks and fish and you see a couple of choice pieces, uh, guys that grill, we know this, right? You like keep a choice piece for yourself. And if somebody comes by, you even throw a junk piece on top of that piece. So you go, which one do you want? You know, it's it's having someone come up and say, pick me out a good piece. And you're like, oh, I'm saving this for me. But you know what? I love you. I want you to have it. Right. It's like being out at Hanalei Bay. Beautiful day. The waves are going off. It's overhead. It's perfect conditions. You've been sitting out there for a while. You haven't had a wave yet. You're waiting. And all of a sudden, you're the only one that's out there deep enough. And there's only one other guy next to you. And, and this perfect set comes in. And you're all excited because you're in the deeper spot. And if you don't surf, you need to understand whoever's in the deepest spot, it's their wave. That's the rules. That's etiquette. Surfing etiquette, right? Deepest guy gets the wave. But you got a guy next to you. But he knows you're deeper and it's yours. And as it's coming to you, your heart's starts pounding you're all excited because you know you're going to get barreled and you're just about to paddle for it and you look over at this guy and you say go pastor rex <laughs> that's the heart of god <laughs> oh <laughs> keep that in mind please but he says in verse 15, but if we bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one another. God doesn't want us backbiting. He doesn't want us talking about each other. He doesn't want us gossiping about one another. That, that's what happens to a church that's lost the liberty and they've moved towards legalism. There's strife and there's contention. There's a lack of love. And that's the reason why churches fall apart because they get legalistic and they get competitive. And they start looking down at everybody and, and they don't they don't look at Jesus. And it's important for us to do that. Paul says this in the context of legalism, because legalism is so competitive, it always produces strife when you compare yourself with others. Now, we're good at comparing ourselves with one another, aren't we? Because whenever we get called out on the carpet for what we're doing, what do you what do you immediately do? Well, at least I'm not like that guy. Well, at least I'm not as bad as her husband. Well, at least I don't do what he does. But yeah, but we're talking about you. And God's talking about you. Because, listen, you can always find some sorry sap that's doing worse than you to make yourself feel good, right? <laughs> if you're going to compare yourself to anybody, compare yourself to Jesus. He's the standard, not somebody else. If you're married... There's only one perfect per person in that marriage, and it's Jesus. It's not you, husband. It's not you, wife. Stop comparing yourself to other spouses. Compare yourself to Jesus. That's, that's what you strive for. That keeps you out of trouble. Jesus is the standard that we want to follow. In verse 16, he says, Thus I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Is that the answer or what? How cool is that? What's the answer? Walk in the Spirit. How do I keep from fulfilling the flesh? Walk in the Spirit. It's, God simplifies things so easy for us. Here's the problem. The legalist, he reads that backwards. He says, don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, and then you'll walk in the Spirit. That's totally backwards. That's how the legalist looks at it. God just says, listen, here's the deal. Walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does that mean? Stay close to Jesus. You want to have a successful day with Jesus? Start in the Spirit. Wake up. Pray. Get into the Word of God. It's one of the biggest dangers for me. I, I, I like watching news. I like to keep you guys posted on what's going up. I can get up in the morning, and sometimes I wake up early in the morning, like 12, 31 in the, in the middle of the night, and, and, and there's my Bible, and there's the remote. Which one do I grab? God's saying, grab your Bible. And I'm like, well, Lord, there might be some stuff on the news about Israel that it might be good for the church to know about, you know. And I'll hit the news and start watching that, and then I'll swing over to the History Channel because there might be something that'll work good in the message. Right? And God's saying, no, just put the remote down and talk to me. Get into the Word. Walk in the Spirit. See, that's the key to success. If you walk in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh because you don't have time for the flesh. Why? Because you're making time for Jesus. If, if you don't get up and pray and then get into the Word, 
you're, you're just setting yourself up for a bad day. I'm serious. I'm give, this, listen, I'm giving you the answer to success. If you do this, watch your life turn around and change. You've got to stay close to Jesus. Where Jesus goes, I go. When Jesus stops, I stop. When Jesus says do this, do that. When he says don't do this, don't do it. Pretty simple, huh? Amen? It's pretty simple. And I was thinking about this this week, and I started thinking about Cindy and Bruno's dog. What's your dog's name? Lilikoy. Beautiful dog. Irish setter. Beautiful dog. Cindy goes and walks around Kilauea with the dog. She comes by the house sometimes to get my wife to go walk with her. One thing I noticed about this dog, check this out. This dog doesn't have a leash. This dog is so well trained that when Cindy starts to walk, the dog walks. When Cindy stops, the dog stops. Wherever Cindy goes, the dog goes. And when she stops, the dog stops. And I thought, how cool is that? That's how we should be, right, with Jesus? No, I know you're not a bunch of dogs. But you know what I'm saying? It, to me, it was like an illustration of walking in the Spirit. And, and if you got a cat, that's like walking in the flesh. Right? right? We got a cat. This cat doesn't want anything to do with me. I mean, it doesn't even give me the time of day, except if it's hungry. If it's hungry, it's like, meow, 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 rubbing off my leg like it loves me. I'll take it over to his dish. I'll give her food, fill the dish. She'll eat, and then she's just totally, that's the happiest she is, is when she eats. And then she'll walk by me, and she'll just go, hey, how you doing? Oh, that's right, I don't care. <laughs> and I thought, you know, in a sense, some Christians are like dogs and some are like cats. Some stay right next to the master, but then other Christians don't want anything to do with the master until they need something. Fix this. Give me this. Get me out of trouble. Put Jesus before your flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Jesus wants to guide you. Do you want to live by the law, or do you want to live by grace? I want to live by His grace. It's so much better. It's so much easier on me because now I'm doing everything in my power, not my power, but in his power. When I try to do it in my power, I make a mess of things. If I just let him lead, everything works out. And if I'm being led by the Spirit, then I'm not under the law, and I won't be breaking the law because I'm being led by the Spirit, which is telling me, do this and don't do that. It's so much easier. I mean, what helps you to obey the law? How many of you obey the speed limit? I thought that about you guys. Nobody. How can you? How do you go down Kalihiwai Bridge at 25 miles an hour? My car coasts faster than that. You got to ride the brakes the whole way down. I think they got something going with Midas. Because when your brakes wear out, you got to go there. You can't do it. Molawa Dairy Drive. That's easy 65, 70 mile an hour zone, right? Not 50. If you're going straight down a hill, it's just like your car just starts cruising. You don't even know you're going that fast. You get to the bypass road in Kapa'a, you're thinking, I'll take the bypass so we can meet all the traffic, right? We want to beat the traffic. But then it's 25 miles an hour. How are you beating anything? That's where I got my ticket. Cops were hiding in the buffalo grass with a radar, and it got me at 35. I thought that was ungodly. I didn't think they could hide like that. So, we know what the speed limit signs are. We know what all the signs on the highway say. We know what the no parking signs say. We know, you know, do this, don't do that signs. But what gets you to obey those signs? When you look in the rearview mirror and there's Popo, right? The blue lights, McGarrett, 5 the police are behind you, and immediately what do you do? You're looking at the rearview mirror, you're watching the speedometer. Rearview mirror, speedometer. Rearview mirror, speedometer. You almost want to just pull over and let them go ahead, right? Because you just get nervous. I say that because what keeps me in line is the person of the Holy Spirit being present and understanding that the person of the Holy Spirit is present and I don't want to do anything to upset God. And I'm doing so much better than I used to. I'm not what I should be. I'm still a work in progress, but I'm doing better. Why? Because I'm learning to let the Holy Spirit lead. Jesus makes it so easy for us here. He says, don't struggle with your flesh. Just walk in the Spirit. Guys, I know I've told you these things before, but I'm going to say it again because I want you to remember this. Jesus makes stuff so easy for us. 
He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen? Okay, here's our problem. The legalist side of me tries so hard to keep the commandments. Jesus says, stop trying. You're trying to do it in your own power. Stop. You want to keep the commandments? Thought. He makes it real simple. Love me more. Hello? You mean that's all I got to do is love him more? Yeah. He says, listen, you want your prayers answered and you want to produce fruit in your life? Stop trying. Just abide in me more. Abide in my word. What? I mean, if I just love you more and abide, all those things will get done? Yeah. And now he's saying to us, listen, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So stop trying to resist the flesh and just walk in the spirit again instead. If you're talking to Jesus all day long, if you get in the word of the God and you're communicating with the Lord all day long, guess what? You will be walking in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. In verse 17, he says this for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the spirit, you are not under the law. That's the good news. I'm being led by the Spirit. I'm not under the law. I can't earn my way. I just got to accept the grace that God has given me. I got to let the Holy Spirit lead me, and then I'm going to do okay. He says there's a war going on. The flesh, notice it's the flesh that attacks first. The flesh wars against the Spirit, and then the Spirit digs in against the flesh to defend us, to protect us. Now, he's not talking about flesh, the physical frame here. He's talking about the fallen nature. That you and I have a fallen nature. He's not talking about demons and spirits here. Because sometimes you hear people, oh, the works of the flesh, that's, that, those are demons and spirits. You know, you hear someone say, oh, oh she's got the demon of lust. And, or he's got the spirit of alcoholism. That's a bunch of nonsense. It's talking about a fallen nature. We can't be possessed. We've got the Holy Spirit. We don't have the demon of this and the demon of that. And, oh, well, you got the demon of lust, but you want to get drunk. Well, the demon of lust can't do that. We got to get the demon of alcohol to do that. And, what? There's no evil spirit, demon spirits. It's fallen nature. It's our flesh. We battle against our flesh. That's what he's talking about. We war, we battle. And we battle against things that we don't even really notice that we're letting our flesh get the best of us. I mean, we could think of the, one, you know, the certain things, of course, right? Brawling, drugs, immorality, things like that. But we don't think about the little subtle things. You know what I'm saying? Nobody? Okay. How's this? Some of you have certain seats in here. You sit there every week. And matter of fact, I know if you're here by where you sit. And when you move to a different seat, it freaks me out. I can't find you. <laughs> but here's the thing. I see you sometimes come in and you walk in and then you come down the aisle and you stop and there's someone in your seat. And you're like, everybody knows that's my seat. I can't believe it. You don't say anything, but I can just see the wheels spinning in your head, right? Listen, you go to, you go to a, a shopping center and you're trying to get a parking spot and it's really hard to get a parking spot and you finally, you see somebody that's backing out. They're close to the store. You're like, I got a prime spot. You stop, you put on your blinker. People are piling up behind you. They're backing out, but they, the way they back out, it kind of blocks you and as they drive off, somebody comes the other way and whips right in. Now, what comes to the surface? The spirit or the flesh, right? You got a brand new car, right? You come out of the store and you find out you got a ding. Right? What comes out of you? The flesh or the spirit? Good questions, huh? <laughs> how about, um, let, me, let me just show you how carnal our flesh is and, and that it's not the physical frame. It's actually the fallen nature. When you, when you go out to eat, you know, everybody's got their favorite restaurant, Right? And you go to a place that's like all you can eat and it's, you know, you, we've all seen those places. They're amazing. Or you go to a place where you know that has quality food and they serve quantity. And I love that, right? So you get there, you're eating all you can eat bread, all you can eat salad bar. So by the time your food comes, you're already packed. But you paid for the next meal, the entree that's coming, whether it's the steak, the lobster or the steak and lobster or whether it's, you know, the, the sashimi, whatever it is. You're like, I paid for it. I'm going to eat this. You're already full, but you're going to eat it anyway. And then you eat so much, you're so full, you can't even breathe. 
You ever been like that? You're like, oh, man, I can't take another bath. And everybody's like undoing their pants under the table because they're like, whoa, man. I mean, you, you can barely talk. You just want to pass out. You think you're going to throw up, right? Because you've eaten so much. Gluttony. You've committed gluttony. You're like, I cannot eat another bite. And then the waitress comes by with a dessert tray. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that looks good, right? Your body is saying, don't do it. And you're like, no, maybe just one piece of cheesecake. And your body's like, just eat it and die. I hate you. Right? That's our fallen nature. Our body doesn't need any more of that. It's our fallen nature is saying, I want more. I want more. And it's the same principle when it comes to drugs and sex. It's like, there's never enough. There's never enough money. There's never enough power. There's never enough sex. People jumping from person to person. There's never enough. And all those things just leave a hole. They leave a void that can only be filled with Jesus. And when you get Jesus in your life, then you can fill that hole and you don't let the flesh run your life. You let the spirit. And so now he's going to list the, some of the things that are of the flesh. And so let's begin at verse 19. We'll read it through. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of that which I to tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That kind of scares me. Because I'm looking at some of that stuff, and I'm guilty. And maybe you're looking at this and you're thinking, man, I'm guilty of a few of these. And so the scary part is, he says, those that make a lifestyle of this should not inherit the kingdom of God. You're fooling yourself. You're, you're coming to church for fire insurance. You're saying, I want to live my life however I want to live it. Don't get involved, Lord. But when I die, you make sure you take me to heaven. And God says, you deceive yourself. I don't know you. The truth is not in you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's a scary thing. So I say to you today, examine yourselves to see where you're at. Let's go back over that list. He first mentions adultery. What's adultery? Adultery is when you are married to one person and you are having sex with somebody that you're not married to. If you're in adultery, you're in sin. You're not led by the Spirit and you're not filled with the Spirit. And then he talks about fornication. Now, fornication is a lot more broader when we think of fornication, we think of somebody, I'm sleeping with somebody I'm not married to, and I'm not married either, and that's fornication. But there's a broader uh, realm of that. It's, 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 it speaks of every type of sexual immorality. It could be homosexuality, lesbianism. Uh, it could be fornication. It could be adultery. It could be bestiality. It could be pedophiles. It could be transgender. It just labels everything. Lots of reasons that you shouldn't sleep with somebody that you're not married to or be hopping from person to person is because today's world, you're playing Russian roulette. There are so many more diseases out there today than ever before that will kill you. And matter of fact, Kauai has more uh, youngsters under 18 contracting sexually transmitted diseases uh, than anywhere else in our nation per capita based on our population. You're, you're risking your life. And not to, imagine, not to mention that, but here's the other thing, that when you, uh, when you start sleeping around with different people, you know, the Bible says the two become one. And there's something that happens there. And so if you take two pieces of wood and you glue them together with that super glue, that gorilla glue, whatever it is, and then you try to rip those two apart, what happens? Parts of each board get ripped and go away with the other piece. So this piece has part of this piece, and this piece has part of that piece, and, and, and so you're, you're leaving your, a piece of yourself with everybody that you've been with. And the danger in that is that when you finally find the person that you love and you get into a relationship and you get married, is that oftentimes what happens is you start comparing yourself with others. You start comparing your spouse to other people. He talks about uncleanness here. Uncleanness is a thought or attitude. Uh, it's internet porn. They say one out of four men in church are caught up in internet porn. And they say ladies is almost just as bad. That's crazy. Look around the room. We do two services here. They're saying one out of four Christians are into porn. 
That's nuts. Guys, girls, get away from that. Put a filter on your computer. You can put a filter on your computer that won't allow that stuff to go through. Because what happens is now, if you start watching that stuff, now your spouse never measures up to you because you've watched all this crazy, phony stuff on the internet. Uncleanness. Then there's lasciviousness. Well, what's lasciviousness? You're saying, I don't know what lasciviousness is, so I guess I don't have to worry about it. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is, so you do. Lasciviousness is just wantonness. It's wantonness. It's saying, I don't care what you say, Pastor. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to sleep with whoever I want. I'm going to take whatever I want. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to do anything I want, and I'm not going to listen to anybody. Wantonness. If that's your attitude, you're on this list. There's so much junk out there today, isn't there? I mean, I'll tell you what, when it comes to sinning, I don't need any help, right? I mean, you watch the TV, the stuff that's on TV, is it mind-blowing? How it's destroying the family unit? How it's destroying what a husband is, what a wife is, what kids are? I mean, and, and the, the things that it encourages us in, it blows me away. I don't know about you, but there's, there's offensive commercials on on TV. I mean, I'll be watching a good movie, and then the Victoria's Secret commercial comes on. I don't need any help. I'm, well, you guys probably don't get this, you younger people, but you older people, you do. Victoria's Secret commercials, in my day growing up, that was Playboy. That's what people bought those magazines for, to see girls in their lingerie. I mean, now it's just right out there. My point is this, I don't need any help. I'm, I struggle with things in my head just like you do. That's why I need to walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. There's so much stuff out there, but you need to stay close to Jesus. He says idolatry. What's idolatry? You're thinking, well, I don't worship statues. Idolatry is anything that you make more important than God. It could be a person. It could be a spouse. It could be your children. It could be a job. It, it could be a thing. It could be a place. Anything that becomes more important to God, you've now committed idolatry. Witchcraft. You're saying, oh, I don't have to do it. worry about that. I'm not involved in witchcraft. I'm not drawing pentagrams, cutting off chickens' heads, pouring blood on myself. Well, okay, yeah, that's part of it. But it goes way deeper. The word is pharmakia. Drugs. God calls it witchcraft. Why? Because it opens up a window for demonic activity in your life. You're opening up a, a doorway for demons to come in and oppress you and screw you up. Don't do it. What was he talking about? He's talking about drugs that, that cause you to alter your mind. Heroin. Crack cocaine, cocaine, crank, crystal meth, mushrooms, peyote, all those things. They open you up to a spirit world that you don't want to be opened up to. Crazy stuff that people are doing. The, the ice that's going around right now is nuts. The meth, the crystal meth. And people are still like, they're trying anything. I was, I was reading an article this week, and I, I, you're going to laugh. The big thing right now that's going on, toad licking. Anybody heard about toad licking? Well, let me bring it to you. Toad licking. It's the new greatest craze. Matter of fact, there's a rehab institute in Arizona's Institute for toad licking. It's, it's sweeping the nation. There are these toads that secrete this, uh, this oil when they feel threatened. And if you lick it, you hallucinate. And so, like, they have this one in uh, Arizona. It's called uh, the cane toad. It's about the size of a plate. And then they have some in Colorado and in the Sonoma Desert. I mean, it's, it, it's cra You don't believe me, do you? Go on the internet. Check it out. It, it'll go through the filter. It'll work. You know, and that sounds so weird, doesn't it? Some of you are acting like, you know what, even if I wasn't saved, I've never licked a toad. And you're like, oh, give me a break. Right? It just shows us that the flesh will stoop to anything. How do I know that? I can prove it to you. Who was the first guy that said, I'm going to lick a toad? And then who was his friend that said, wow, you licked a toad? And that's what happened? I'm going to lick a toad. I mean, that's just how crazy things are for us. <laughs> Pharmakia, witchcraft. It's not just 
dabbling with here. And let me make this clear too. God wants you to stay away from, hear me straight, stay away from the horoscopes, stay away from tarot cards, stay away from palm readers and crystal balls, stay away from seances and trying to raise the dead and speak to the dead. Stay away from all that stuff. It'll only cause you heartbreak. He goes on to the next one. He says, hatred. What is hatred? Well, we all know what that is. I don't need to explain that. We're called to love one another, even to love our enemies. Variance. What's variance? That's sowing discord with your mouth. Oh, darn. Gossip. Isn't it funny that he puts stuff like gossip and unforgiveness and backbiting right in there with murder, adultery, witchcraft? See, our problem is we put sin on levels. God doesn't. Emulations. What's emulations? Jealousies. Are you jealous of someone? You might even be jealous of your spouse. If you're jealous of everything your spouse does, you're, you're going to fall apart quick. If you can't trust people, you're going to fall apart quick. Jealousies. Wanting what someone else has that you don't have. Wrath. That's outburst of anger. Now, some of you, I know some of you, you used to just, you know, you get in an argument with somebody, start punching. And God's transformed your life. You don't do that anymore. He says those that do those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those that are saying that they're Christians, they're going around hitting people all the time? That's crazy. Strife. Strife means selfish ambitions. You don't do anything unless there's something in it for you. Seditions. That's mean causing divisions in the church or causing divisions among others. Heresies. Religious divisions. Envying. He puts envying on the same level as murder. Is that crazy or what? Envying? Murder? Drunkenness. That's self-explanatory. Revelings. Revelings is like when you party and you wake up the next morning and you have no idea what you did or where you're at or who you're with. That's revelings. And then he says, and such like. That means there's a lot of other stuff. And such like. Of that which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, before you all walk out of here scared to death, because there was something there for all of us, let me remind you, he's not saying when you mess up. Because we all mess up. And you may mess up and do one of these things, but the difference is you hate that. It grieves you. The difference is you come to the Father and you beg for forgiveness. You're repentful. You're remorseful. You don't want, you're broken inside. He's speaking to someone here who might be here today that says, listen, I'm going to do these things and I'm going to do them day in and I'm going to do them day out and I don't care what anybody says. He says, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If there is something that we read off here that you are making a lifestyle practice of, and you don't care what God thinks, and you're going to do it no matter what, he says you're not going to make it. So how do you know you're his? I'll close with this. Your sin grieves you. That's how you know. You started loving people that you never loved before. That's how you know. And that there's a war going on inside. Amen? Amen? I remember a story of uh, Dr. Ironside. He was a famous preacher traveling across the U.S. in a train, heading to California, stopped in South Dakota. There was nothing there, just barren. He stops in South Dakota. There's a layover. He gets off the train, and he goes off to the side. He starts preaching the Word of God, and people start gathering around. Well, along comes this Indian Native American, whatever. I don't know what's politically correct now. I'm an in, part Indian, so I can say Indian. Doesn't matter, right? This Indian walks up, listens to the whole message. Dr. Ironstein goes up to him afterwards, starts to talk to him, <laughs> finds out that he's been saved for quite some time, and he's a little blown away because he's blown away how rooted and grounded this Indian guy is in the Word. And he says, wow, how did you know that you were saved when you got saved? And, and the guy said, I knew I was saved the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ and a war broke out inside. He said, a war? And he goes, yeah, a war. He goes, I have a white dog 
and a black dog inside. And Dr. Ironstein said, and they fight? And he goes, oh, yeah. And he says, I'm curious, which one wins? And he said, the dog I feed the most. What are you feeding the most? Are you feeding the flesh? Or are you feeding the spirit? Let every man examine himself. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you that you're so awesome, that you make it so simple for us. If we love you more, we'll keep the commandments. If we abide in you more, our prayers will be answered, we'll produce fruit. If we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Oh, thank you for making it so simple. Thank you for placing your Holy Spirit, your Spirit in us, Lord God, to guide and lead us. Let us have the strength to allow you to lead Lord, bless the people that are here today. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, can you just pray in your heart right now, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. I change my mind of who you are, and I ask you to save me in Jesus' name. If you just prayed that, you're a child of God. Go live your life for Jesus and walk by the Spirit. Amen? God bless you guys.